for that introduction and uh, thanks to the Vermont Land Trust for hosting this webinar. Um, really excited to talk to you all tonight about the Christmas bird count. It's an excellent way for anyone and everyone to uh, get involved in community science, uh, learn the joy that birds bring us and contribute to the data collection that uh, scientists use to understand bird populations and what they need for survival. So um, what we'll cover tonight, um, I'm going to kind of go through the basics of who, what, when, where, how in uh, a guide to joining the Christmas bird count. I'll go over what it is, when it happens, how it works, and how you might uh, participate, what the data are used for, if you can do it at your feeder, who you might contact, and then I'll turn the presentation over to my co-hosts who will give you a little bit more detailed information on what species you might expect, um, share some fun memories, uh, talk about conserved land and birding there. Um, and then maybe if we have time, we'll do a bird quiz at the end. So I'll start by defining what the Christmas bird count is. CBC is generally the accepted acronym for that. It is an annual early winter bird census where thousands of volunteers all throughout North and South America count birds over a specified 24 hour period in a certain area around the holiday. Um, and you'll see from the pictures here, um, this is during the same time period around the Christmas bird count. Folks in New York City are doing their count in the snowy New York City. And then um, folks down in sunny, warm Key West, Florida are also doing their count there. The Christmas bird count is the longest running community science survey in the world. This year uh, will be the 123rd anniversary and it's organized by the National Audubon Society. So how did it start? Here's a little bit of history. Um, at, uh, in the late 1800s, um, bird populations had significantly declined uh, as a result of unregulated overhunting, uh, feather collection for the hat trade, and a lot of folks started to get uh, concerned about wildlife populations and birds. And prior to 1900, there was a holiday hunting tradition known as the Christmas side hunts, where teams would split up and they would shoot as many animals, um, birds or mammals as possible. And whoever came home with the biggest bag won the competition. So on Christmas Day in 1900, an ornithologist named Frank Chapman proposed an alternative to this side hunt, and he suggested counting birds instead of shooting them. And on that original Christmas bird count, there were 27 birders in 25 areas who counted nearly 90 species combined. And now today we have over 70,000 volunteers in 2,400 locations in 20 countries in the Western Hemisphere, which is pretty amazing. And around the same time, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act was passed in 1918. And so during this period, it was kind of the start of a conservation area where conservation era where folks shifted their mindset and started thinking more about uh, wildlife appreciation and protection. So when is the CBC period? It occurs between December 14th and January 5th each year, dates inclusive, so it can happen on those dates themselves. And a local organizer, what we call a circle compiler, will choose a single day within that range to do the count. Is it free? Yes, you'll need your own transportation, binoculars, something to write with, and warm clothing, but it is free. So how does it work? What do I do to get involved? The CBC is open to all skill levels. If you are a beginner birder, your compiler will typically pair you up with a more experienced person to help you learn. And each count is conducted within an established 15 mile diameter circle. So you'll need to contact that local organizer in advance to participate in the count. And then 
volunteers will be divided into teams and they'll kind of be assigned different sections within that circle and given routes to cover to make sure everything is accounted for. And you'll be counting all the birds you see or hear that day, um, how many of them, and then some effort information like how long you spend and how far you travel. And then you'll send your compiler all, all the data you've collected that day, and your compiler will be the one that submits the official report to Audubon. So to find your circle and the date that the count is being held in that circle, you'll go to the Audubon website, and we have a Christmas bird count page there. You'll find a link to a map, which is interactive, and it looks like this. Um, you'll notice that there are red, green, and yellow circles. Red circles are full and green and yellow circles are um, still open and still needing coverage and looking for more participants to join. And when you zoom in on this map, um, you'll see the, this is a screenshot of all the circles that are established in Vermont. And you can click on the circle nearest where you live and it will bring up information um, that is helpful for finding um, the person who to contact and their email address. And when you scroll down in this little window, it'll also give you the date that that compiler has chosen to run the count that year. And this is just an example of the Plainfield Christmas bird count where they have designated by color uh, different sections, just to give you an example of how teams might split up and cover different routes. So what data exactly do I record? Every bird you see or hear in your assigned area and how many, um, and only between midnight and 11.59 p.m. on your count date. So it's not a 24 hour period from when you start at noon to the next day at noon. It's only on that calendar day that your compiler has selected. And you'll also record all the hours you spent watching or listening for birds which helps us calculate a metric number of birds per party hour. You'll also wanna record the miles you've traveled while watching or listening and which mode of transportation you use. So a lot of folks do this by car. Uh, you can cover a lot more distance that way. However, uh, walking around by foot and birding by foot, you get to hear and see a lot more birds. So I encourage you to do um, both if you can. And then you're also going to want to separate the hours that you spent watching at your feeder or owling um, before the sun comes up from the data you record birding in the field during the day. Can I use eBird and transfer information? Yes, you definitely can. This is a common mode of uh, data recording, but there are a few considerations. eBird checklists are not flagged or automatically included in the CBC database. So it's critical that you share the checklist that you generate with your compiler or the account that they've created for their circle. You're gonna to wanna to keep multiple checklists throughout the day, one for each uh, stop or road or change in transportation mode, and this will create a trip report for the day. Again, same as if you were recording on paper, you'll need to include the distance and time spent for each checklist. And then just communicate with your compiler if uh, some individual birds might be on multiple checklists so you can avoid double counting. And eBird, the website itself does have a page specifically devoted to Christmas bird counts and a little bit more detailed information there on how to do it in a way that will help you and your compiler. This is an example of what a trip report would look like on eBird. So you'll have your, your general area and then multiple checklists on the same trip report. There are no circles near me. Can I start my own? Anyone can propose a new CBC circle that doesn't overlap with an existing one. However, it's really important to emphasize filling the existing circles and making sure that those are adequately covered before starting a new one. You'll need to read the requirements and fill out an application form for starting a new one. And just be aware that establishing a new one is a long-term commitment and they'll wanna make sure that there's a compiler and enough folks to um, count in future years. Can I do a count from my feeder at home? 
If your home is within the boundaries of a CBC circle that has already been established, then yes, you can certainly count um, on count day as long as you have already talked to your count compiler and you uh, record the hours that you spend watching at your feeder. Can I just do my own CBC circle and send in data? No, unfortunately, this is a real census and methods must be the same as other circle efforts to be scientifically valid and statistically comparable from year to year. And a 15 mile diameter circle is just way too big for a single person to cover um, and count adequately. Some really great alternatives are Project Feeder Watch for the Great Backyard Bird Count, which happens uh, every February this year. It's from the 17th to the 20th. Um, and I believe Maya will send um, a follow-up email after uh, this presentation to all the participants, which will include links to all of the resources and um, the projects that I've mentioned here tonight. What's the policy and ethics behind using attractant noises for recorded bird song and calls? Playback is permitted, but it's not necessarily encouraged. The monitoring period that CBC falls within is outside of the primary breeding season of most species, but just keep in mind that anytime you use playback, you um, are causing birds to respond and exert energy um, responding to that playback that they might otherwise conserve. But Bottom line, um, it's important to keep methods consistent when you're counting data over time. So if you always use playback, then maybe continue to do so just so it's consistent. What about trail cams, remote audio recorders, or live stream feeder cams? Although these are really cool, unfortunately, no only human observations can be used for CBC official data. What is a count week? So say, for example, your uh, Christmas bird count day is de designated for the 15th of December. Count week is the three days immediately before and the three days immediately after that count day. Um, and keep in mind that your count week can extend outside of the official count period, but your count day just has to be within the 14th to the 5th. And during uh, count week, those three days before and after, you'll be recording species only. No other information is needed, like numbers or date or time. Um, and that's because it's not part of the official census data for the Christmas bird count that will be submitted. It's just sort of a chance to uh, mark more species off on your list that you weren't able to see on count day. So say for example, you saw four great blue herons on the 13th, you would just check that species off and write CW next to it. But if you saw four on count day, you would record the number and you wouldn't have them on both your count day list and your count week list. So you would just record it for count day. What is CBC data used for? CBC data has been instrumental in the development of scientific modeling and reports on the status of bird populations, along with the Breeding Bird Survey. Um, it's a long-term data set over a wide geographic area, so it's been very, very important for scientists and researchers in understanding bird population changes, habitat health, rain shifting, all sorts of information. Federal agencies, such as the Environmental Protection Agency, use CBC data as an indicator of climate change. So for example, a recent model predicted that 314 of 588 North American bird species may lose more than 50% of their range by 2080 due to climate change. And CBC data has been involved in the publication of over 300 peer-reviewed articles and most notably, oops, going forward, not backwards. Most notably is um, an article that was published in Science in 2019. This looked at um, bird populations from 1970 to 2019. And Science is one of the most prestigious scientific journals in the world. And some of their findings were pretty staggering. Uh, they, they found uh, a change in bird population 
over 300 billion birds lost since then. And when they divided into different habitat types, they found that um, grassland birds, boreal forest birds, western forest birds were some of the species that were being hit the hardest and declining the most rapidly. So as a result of CBC data contributing to a large paper like this, um, there was all sorts of um, advocacy for groups and a website called 3billionbirds.com developed to try to get the word out about how birds are in trouble and they need our help. And so all of these graphics were designed and we see 3 billion birds lost. That means one in four birds gone since 1970, two in five aerial insectivores, two in five migratory birds, and three and four grassland birds. But what I think is the coolest part is at the, the bottom of this prestigious scientific article is in the acknowledgement section, it shows um, that the National Audubon's Christmas bird count data were used in the generation of this analysis. And they thank the many volunteers who contributed to the long-term bird monitoring programs in there. So it's pretty cool to think that by involving yourself with a Christmas bird count, you can be contributing to data that gets published in a journal like Science. What have conservationists learned? Um, the North American Bird Conservation Initiative puts out a state of the birds report each year, and they started in 2009, I believe. And this is a, a similar graphic showing information that the article um, I just talked about also presented. And we see grassland birds and forest birds and arid land birds being, being hit pretty hard. And they identified 67% of our bird species have sort of reached a tipping point where if we don't do something now, they are in serious trouble. But they also highlighted that some birds like water birds and dabbling and diving ducks actually have increased um, in recent decades. And this might be connected to wetland protection and policy change and a good demonstration that sometimes when we collect data and we analyze it and we put out reports, um, we can lean on those data and we can develop conservation action and it can work to help these species. So with that, I am done with my section of the presentation, and I will hand it over to my co-host. Excellent. Thank you, Cassie. Um, going right into it, after what Cassie was just talking about, using Christmas bird count data to track populations and their trends across the entirety of the United States, Canada, and North America as a whole, uh, we can also use this data to look at each species individually on, a, on an individual species scale. And we can look at the trends and the shifts in their ranges over time. Um, two examples that we have here in Vermont of recent arriving species that have not previously been seen, you know, four or five decades ago are the red-bellied woodpecker and the Carolina wren. And so you can see this graphic here on the bottom. Um, it's standardized with birds per party hour on the y-axis and it has um, the year which since the Christmas bird count began at 1900 you just subtract one from the number to get the year um, that, that it's representing but you can see that you know early on back in the 1950s or 80s um, there really were hardly any Carolina wrens this is also pulling from data of the Champlain Valley um, all the Christmas bird counts in the Champlain Valley you can see that there was no Carolina wrens or red-bellied woodpeckers hardly at all um, back in, in, the, in the late 1900s. And then now as we're getting into the 2000s, 2010, and then the most recent Christmas bird counts, we've seen excellent numbers of red-bellied woodpeckers and Carolina wrens overwintering. So they not only have established their breeding populations here, but they're also overwintering in Vermont, which is pretty, pretty spectacular finding by Christmas bird count data. You can advance the slide. So what species can we expect when we are out on the Christmas bird count? Well, some of you that may be sitting at home and volunteering at, as feeder watchers, or even those of you that are out and about, um, I'm gonna kind of start in the top right here um, with the, the 
black and white bird. So that's the dark eyed junco. Uh, if we go to the right of that, we have the American goldfinch. And then if we're going to jump down a row, go left to right again, we'll go black capped chickadee, blue jay, tufted titmouse, and white breasted nuthatch. Um, these are just some species that you can really expect to see visiting your bird feeders uh, in the wintertime. Um, some of them, like the chickadee, the blue jay, and the tufted titmouse and nuthatch, those are all birds that'll be visiting black oil, sunflower seed feeders, um, suet cakes. We also have in the bottom left hand corner downy woodpeckers. Um, and hairy woodpeckers as well will be visiting suet cakes. Um, and so these are just some of the, the very common birds that we'll, we expect to see every Christmas bird count in some number. Um, we also have duck species. If you happen to be near a water source that has open water, uh, we have a mallard hen on the left and a beautiful drake wood duck on the right, which would be quite the find on, on any Vermont Christmas bird count as most wood ducks tend to move southward um, but there have been a few a few wood ducks found that have overwintered in Vermont during Christmas bird counts. Of course, the beautiful male northern cardinal just to the right of the wood duck there, uh, ring-billed gulls as well, and morning doves. And then just above the morning dove, we have that raptor, that's the red-tailed hawk. Um, it just goes to show, you know, even though it's winter, it's cold, you may not hear birds singing a lot. There's still a lot to find in the forests and fields of Vermont. Uh, as you can see, our 70 plus species are still found every year on Christmas bird counts. Um, so there's there's a lot to find, a lot to see. Uh, and they're just so charismatic and fun to watch in winter and easy to see as well, because in spring and summer when the leaves are out, they can be really difficult to see. But now they afford us some pretty great looks. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So here are some of my favorite species. These are the birds that breed pretty much in the Arctic tundra or in the boreal forests of Canada. Um, these are our regular northern visitors, visitors from the north, uh, snowbirds as some people call them. Essentially, Vermont is the wintering grounds of these birds and they breed further to the north. So it's similar to like, say someone in Vermont doesn't want to overwinter, they go to Florida for the winter. That's basically Vermont is their Florida. Um, it's their wintering ground. So we have the horned grebe. Uh, you find those in the Champlain Valley on Lake Champlain. If there happens to be open water, which we are seeing more and more frequently as years go on, there's usually open water during the Christmas bird count period. So you could see some horned grebes. The Northern Shrike, AKA the butcher bird, um, no bigger than a blue jay, but just an amazing predatory bird. Uh, catches rodents and small passerine or perching birds um, and will actually skewer them on thorns and store them uh, for, to find them as food later. Um, American tree sparrows, snow bunting and Laughlin longspur, also horned lark. All those birds are birds that you'll frequently find out in like shrubby fields or open cornfields. Um, the snow bunting, horn lark, and Lapland longspur you could also find on plowed roads going through open fields. They really like to come down and get the salt or grit, um, any dirt that's exposed by plowing. Um, you can see them feeding pretty often in the in the roads there. And you'll notice that most of these birds, including the rough-legged hawk and the short-eared owl, both of them are raptors and they like to hunt in really open spaces. And so really it seems like after some observation, you'll notice that these birds that are visiting from the Arctic tundra are using habitats that are quite similar to what they're finding. Uh, the Arctic tundra is vastly uh, open expanses of grasses um, and like forbs and everything. And so these birds are just coming and finding the habitat that's similar down here. And, and overwintering. So these are just some selection of birds that we get every winter. You can go to the next slide. And then we have the eruptive species. And so eruption is not like what you're thinking with a volcano going off and lava pouring out. No, this is eruption with an I. And it's a word used to describe when populations are going from boom to bust. Um, so essentially when there's really good years of food, up on the breeding grounds for these birds. They'll have a ton of young. And then some years, they may have really good food for the breeding season, but there may not be enough food for them in the winter time. And then may that food source may dry out pretty quickly. They may, you know, some birds like evening grosbeaks will be relying really heavily on like 
some birch seeds or alder seeds or mountain ash berries maybe. Um, red cross bills, they have a cross bill to help them open up pine cones. So maybe if there's not a good cone crop up north, then you'll find them moving in really big numbers down into the Champlain Valley through Vermont. Um, this year especially, um, there's been a spruce budworm outbreak in the boreal forests. Um, and spruce budworm, it's just an insect, but the birds that breed up there really like to eat it. It really contributes to very successful breeding seasons. Um, and evening grosbeaks, which are one bird that through the, the three billion birds paper, we found that every nine, we've lost nine and 10 evening grosbeaks since 1970. So we've seen extreme declines in evening grosbeaks. But this year, due to the spruce budworm outbreak up north, um, they've had a lot of young, a lot of success, and there's not enough food for them up there. So they have been moving south in big numbers. And Vermont has been treated with, with a great number of evening grosbeaks this year. So that's definitely something to be excited for for the Christmas bird count season. Pine grosbeaks are berry eaters. So you can see them visiting um, crab apple trees, uh, in industrial parks or around cities, college campuses. They're very easy to find when they come through. Um, they're probably one of our more rare eruptive species. Snowy owls, uh, they're not so reliant on the seeds of birches or the berries of mountain ash. They're reliant more on lemming um, and other rodents up on the Arctic tundra. And so rodents are on a very pendulous um, population boom and bust as well. And so in years when the snowy owls are doing well and the lemming happen to be non-existent, then we can get them moving down south uh, in pretty big numbers as well. Pine siskins, another great bird to look at for at your feeder. Uh, red crossbills, common red poles, and every once in a while, a great gray owl will show up, which is a real treat and just an amazing bird to see. Um, Anytime we're observing snowy owls or great gray owls, these are very birds that are very sensitive to disturbance. So we want to make sure that we're being very respectful, keeping our distance and limiting the time that we are observing these species, just because they, they are easily disturbed by humans and constant disturbance can take them away from conserving energy or hunting food. We can move on to the next slide. So, Talking about eruptions, the Pine Grosbeak eruption of 2021. Uh, the map on the left, I believe, is the winter of 2020. And so this is taken from eBird.org. And you can see that one little pin up by the St. Albans area. That's the only sighting of Pine Grosbeak in the winter of 2020. Um, then we take a jump to the winter of 2021. And you can see these are all the sightings from that winter. You can see there's a huge difference. So 2020, the winter of December 2020 and January of 2021 was a huge eruption year for pine grosbeaks. Um, and they were found all across the state. And that's really just, again, based on the distribution of food and the availability of food. Um, and so Christmas bird counts are a great time to get out there and just kind of start observing these bird species as they may be moving south through Vermont and seeing, is it an eruption year? You know, what are their populations like in Vermont this year? And also with the network across North America, you can really help pinpoint where those species are holding up for the winter. We can go to the next slide. So some of my favorite experiences of the Christmas bird count happen to be the last Christmas bird count I was able to participate in in December of 2020. Um, it was the Burlington Christmas bird count, which is usually the third Saturday or third Sunday, um, something like that. You can find it on the website. But I was on in a sector that contains St. Michael's College Natural Area, which is in Colchester and Essex, Vermont. And I was walking around with a fairly new birder. Um, and this is, again, the beginning of the big finch eruption year of 2020 and 2021. And so we decided to go check out the shrubby field. And so we start walking through this shrubby field, real, lots of weeds, um, lots of seeds there for the birds to eat. Um, and we came across big flocks of common red poles, which are those two pictures on the left there, uh, the upper left and then the kind of upper center. Those are common red poles, big flocks of common red poles, like flying around in this really wide, expansive, uh, weedy field. 
we were just getting excellent looks at these little finches. It seems like they've never seen humans before because they breed so far up on the Arctic tundra is the only explanation for how close we could get to these birds. They're just so all you know fully involved in, in just finding their little seeds, cracking the shells open of whatever thistle or flowers they could find and eating them. And we just were just like you look around at the bushes and they're just littered like little um, ornaments of common common red pools everywhere. So we start working our way around this field and then it comes up to the Winooski River. And as we're looking out on the river, we could see something out on the ice. I thought we were, we were looking for little patches of open water that might have ducks or something in them. Um, you know, just kind of scouring the landscape for any birds that we could find. And we could see something up on the ice in front of us. We could see a couple figures, they were pretty far away. So we duck back over onto the trail and walk down a little more and then we peek out again and we get our binoculars up and we could see that there was three coyotes, um, what looked like three coyotes all around this deer carcass. One of the, the coyotes had ended up trotting off um, immediately. It kind of seen us and sort of spooked and walked off. This other coyote was bedded down next to what we believed to be a, a third coyote uh, at the time. And the coyote stood up, came over to the deer carcass, like took a couple of bites of meat. It was just spectacular. It was probably like 80 yards away or something. I'm taking pictures of it. The birder next to me was just in shock of what we were seeing. Um, and then that coyote looks at us and, and walks away as well. Then the third coyote, I get some pictures of it and it's just sitting there looking at us. And I noticed that it happened to be a bobcat. Um, we were all in shock. And this bobcat just gets up and slowly stretches and then walks over to the deer carcass and takes a seat like, yes, the coyotes have left. I now own the deer carcass. And it was just by far one of my, still to this day, one of my most fantastic wildlife experiences I've ever had. Um, and it definitely would have ha wouldn't have happened if we hadn't have been out on the Christmas bird count that day, scouring every inch of the landscape, counting as many birds as we could. So after that whole encounter took place, the, the bobcat trotted off and we were just still in such shock of what we had witnessed. Um, we ended up walking down the trail a little bit more. And then you can see this picture in the upper right hand corner. Um, this is a hoary red pole. So it's, there's some debate on whether it actually is a true species. There's a lot of ornithologists doing genetics testing, but essentially it, as it stands right now, it is a, a new species, or it is its own species. Um, and so we ended up documenting this hoary red bull. It spills a little squatter into the head. It's undertail. Um, the feathers right at the base of its tail are, are white and unstreaked. There's a few, few ways to identify it. It's overall just kind of a pale, paler bird. Um, and so we found and photographed this bird, and it happened to be the first one ever reported on the, on the Burlington Christmas bird count in history. Um, so it just goes to show there's still so much to find, so much to discover out there. Um, and it, there's always something around every turn. You learn something every day when you're out birding. Um, now I guess I will hand it off to Corey. Thanks, Jacob. So yeah, um, I act as the compiler for the Brattleboro Christmas bird count, um, which thanks for putting a nice picture of it up there. Um, and this will be my sixth year in that, that role. So I just thought I'd talk briefly about kind of what I do as a compiler and kind of why I do it and what some of my favorite parts of it are. Um, so I set the date of our local county each year within that National Audubon window. Um, I do some publicity for the event to try to attract new participants. Um, I identify area leaders. So Cassie mentioned earlier that many people divide their circle up into teams. Um, and so we have seven areas inside of the Brattleboro Circle. And so we have seven area leaders and uh, so if we're lucky, all seven come back every year. My life's really easy. If they don't, I have to recruit new people and make sure they know where to go and what to do. Um, and then I organize those teams, make sure they have enough participants and coverage, recruit people to watch their bird feeders all day. Um, I prepare data sheets um, for the area leaders to use so that they're reporting what they saw and also so they're reporting their effort statistics the way that I need them so that I can compile them and report them uh, accurately to National Audubon. Um, and then um, I also prepare feeder count data sheets that I, I've made really nice little simple data sheets for folks who sit and watch their feeders. So hopefully it's really easy for them to record what they see. One thing I learned from doing this was that um, there are like 
kind of old school nomenclature for some birds. And so I would get these like handwritten on the back of a napkin kind of deal with like species that I wasn't hundred percent sure what they were. So I like standardized that and came up with kind of like a nice little feeder data sheet. And so I've been using those. Um, so that's all kind of the prep work. And then um, the day of the event, I go birding all day with one of the teams. And then at the end of the day, we do a compilation potluck where we we gather usually at somebody's house. Um, everybody brings a dish to pass. We chat and talk about our experience in the field that day. And then um, we compile all the data and we we do that out loud. It's kind of an interactive experience. And so I'll call out the species name and then we'll go around the area teams and they'll each say how many they saw. And it's kind of a fun competition between the teams to see who can have seen the most birds or who saw the most unusual or interesting bird. Um, and, and it's just a really fun kind of like community event. Um, after the event, I gather all the data sheets, all the feeder count sheets, I compile all the data, submit it to National Audubon, along with the effort statistics. We also collect some weather data that they ask for, things like how deep was the snow or how much of the water was frozen or open, um, which helps them give give them context for that, that data, because it does vary wildly from year to year, depending on the kind of winter we're having. Um, and then I prepare a final summary which I share with the group. I put it on our website and I usually send it to the local newspapers. So that's basically the job. And if you've got people that come back every year, it's honestly not all that much work. Um, the COVID year was a real challenge because a lot of folks didn't want to ride together, didn't want to bird together for safety reasons. And so we had to get really creative with how we cover everything in a consistent way and how we keep track of effort statistics if people are off birding in like ones and twos as opposed to bigger teams. Um, I guess for me, why I participate in the Christmas bird count, um, mostly it's a great excuse to go birding, particularly during a time of year where um, I might not go birding otherwise. Um, it's, you know, it's quieter. There are fewer birds. It's cold out. It's gray. It might rain. Um, I like that, you know, there's this one day that that I and a lot of other people are going to go birding no matter what. Like it can ice rain. It can be a blizzard. It could be weirdly warm. Like we're going to go out. We're going to go birding all, all day. And I get excited about that. Um, for me, it's fun to participate in this long running community science project. Um, I kind of view it as a fun challenge to try to figure out where the birds are and to try to locate as many of them as possible. Um, the Brattleboro count was first run in 1903 when 41 individual birds of eight species were observed. Um, it's obviously grown a little bit since then. And I like to think about the data that I'm helping collect today that maybe 100 years from now someone will look at it and be really curious about, you know, the experience that we had and how it compares. I also think it's a really great social event. Um, you know, we have many participants who are not serious birders, and, and we also have people who are brand new birders, and I love that this is a great event to bring them in and, like, show them how fun birding can be and how it's a, a, a social activity, too, and not something that's reserved for, like, kind of elite birders. Um, and then for our for our particular team, the Brattleboro team, area three inside of the Brattleboro circle, um, we eat a lot. We meet for breakfast. We stop and eat lunch. Um, the food is definitely a very key part of the experience for us. Um, we still see a lot of birds, but we, we prioritize having a good time too. Um, and then a big part of the, the drive for me is to try to find unusual birds. Um, the Brattleboro count um, averages 53 species a year in modern times. Um, but there have been 126 species observed over the, the course of the Brattleboro count, including some really surprising species, including green-tailed towie, Pacific loon, Harris's sparrow, and Townsend solitaire. Um, and in terms of like my favorite CBC memories, one of them was the COVID year when I was unfortunately forced to bird by myself for part of the day. And I found a sage thrasher um, in, it was in New Hampshire, but it was on, that was within our circle. Um, and that was a new state bird for the state of New Hampshire, which was pretty exciting as a birder to make a discovery like that. Um, but mostly uh, my favorite memory is just going to the potluck and seeing folks that I might not see that much the rest of the year and hearing about their birding experiences too. So I do, if you haven't done one, I strongly encourage you to consider it. Thanks so much, Corey, for sharing. Um, this is just a slide of all of the compilers within Vermont. Um, you can take a quick look and we'll also send out this list with the follow-up information. Uh, 
Awesome. Thanks, Cassie and Corey and Jacob. Those are some really great stories. It's a lot of fun to hear. Um, so just um, quickly, you know, as you all know, um, the Vermont Land Trust, um, a lot of our properties, the properties that are conserved with us are open to the public. And um, what you see here on the left um, is a shot of a birding event we did this fall at Whetstone Woods in Brattleboro. Um, and on the right is our land map, which you can find on our website. And each of those little icons that you see are um, many, but not all of the properties conserved with us that are open to the public um, for recreation of many different kinds, including birding. Um, and so you can browse that map on our website and I'll, we'll send a link to that um, in our kind of follow-up email after this event. But um, on that map, you can you know, click on each of those icons and find directions and trail maps and kind of some historical context about um, how the property came to be conserved and more information about each of these places. Um, and Cassie, if you could go to the next slide. So we have a lot of different properties on that map. So to kind of narrow it down a little bit, um, our staff also put together a list of places that are great for birding in particular. Um, you know, they may be in your circle. Um, if you're doing the Christmas bird count, they may not, but are generally great spots for birding um, in the winter and all year round. Um, and again, I'll follow up um, with everyone that's here this evening with more information about each of these places, um, but you can see some of them listed here and I kind of tried to illustrate as well where they are in the state. Um, if there's uh, one that might be close to you. And as you can see, there's a wide variety of different kinds of places on this list. Um, we also man we do manage a handful of um, conserved properties as um, forest bird demonstration sites, which is an Audubon initiative um, where we are intentionally managing that land to enhance habitat for forest birds of conservation concern. Um, and there are also a handful of conserves lands where we are specifically managing for golden winged warblers, um, which is a bird associated with young forests that are deemed of to be significant conservation concern um, by the Fish and Wildlife Service because of declining populations. So we're doing some different bird related projects on different properties um, and we do um, try to host some birding events throughout the year as well. Um, we did a couple this summer and fall and uh, hope to do more next year um, as well. So in addition, you know, beyond the Christmas bird count, um, you know, we, we hope to maybe see you at some of those events or, um, you know, encourage you to get out on um, conserved land to do some birding. I don't know if you think we are on track to do the bird ID quiz, Maya, but um, we can do this or we can get to some questions. It's, it's up to you. I think we probably have time for a little, little quiz. All right. Um, Jacob, do you want to take over this quiz or do you want me to go through it? Sure, I could take over. Sounds great. All right. So... I guess we're going to take guesses for identification in the chat originally. All right, so go ahead and input. If you know what this bird is, put it in the chat. Excellent. I'll just give a few seconds for people to put their answers in. Yep. Great. So I'm seeing cedar waxwing and bohemian waxwing. This bird is a bohemian waxwing. So it's, it's very similar to the cedar waxwing, but there are a few differences to note. The cedar waxwing Cassie just put up on the right-hand side of the screen and the bohemian is on the left. Um, one thing that I like to know a lot since birds are usually up in the trees above you um, is the undertail cover um, and the color of the undertail coverts. Um, so you can see like the feathers just under the tail feathers of the cedar waxwing on the right hand side are white, whereas the feathers under the tail on the left hand side of the bohemian waxwing are of dark rusty red color. Some other differences to note, uh, the bohemian waxwing is a little larger, a little chunkier than a cedar waxwing, and overall is more gray in the body and has brighter rusty tones on the head around the mask um, than the cedar waxwing does. 
Also, another thing that you can know on some birds if it's if they're in the right plumage and if you get close enough is just the extra markings on the wings of the bohemian waxwing on the left. You can see they have the yellow, a little more white on their wings, and the cedar waxwings just have the, the red tips of the wings. Um, so both birds, the bohemian waxwing is typically considered an eruptive species as well. Um, so some years will have more coming down than others. Cedar waxwings will probably be here pretty consistently every winter. All right, do we have guesses for the bird on the left? All right, great. I'm seeing a lot of downy woodpecker. Not too many people were fooled by this one. So some of the more confusing identifications that we have um, are the downy versus the hairy woodpecker. Um, at first glance, they definitely look extremely similar, similar patterns um, on the back and on the belly. Um, but some things to note for sure are the bill size. So the bill on the downy woodpecker on the left side and side if you take the, the length of the bill and compare it to like the, the length of the base of the bill to the back of the head, if you take that length, the downy woodpecker, it looks like the bill is a little shorter or maybe about the same length as like the, the distance between the base of the bill and the back of the head. Um, the hairy woodpecker, usually that proportion is a little longer. Maybe the, so the downy is shorter than that length of the, from the base of the bill to the back of the head and the hairy woodpecker is about the same distance long for the bill. So the bill is a little more robust. Downy, downy woodpeckers are quite a bit smaller than hairy woodpeckers. Um, and one field mark that I like to use that usually is pretty diagnostic and less left up to your perception of like the ratio of the bill to the head um, is the markings on the white outer tail feathers. So you'll note on the downy woodpecker on the left-hand side, the white outer tail feathers are, they have some little black dots in them. Um, you can kind of see it looks like a ripple in the black. You can't see it too well from here, but if you saw it from the underside, there'd be nice black dots on the on white under tail feathers. Whereas if we look over on the right at the hairy woodpecker, those white feathers on the outside of the tail are just pure white. There's no black in them at all. Um, so those are some great ID points too. Calls are another way to help you identify downy versus hairy, but that's with, with some practice for sure. Great, all right, do we have guesses for the identification of this feeder bird? Excellent, yes, so this is our house finch. And so we'll see it's similar to the purple finch. Um, a few ways that I like to help, help me identify purple finch from house finch are um, the, the streaking on the flanks of the birds. So just under where the wings kind of meet the belly of the birds, uh, the, per, the house finch typically has like brownish streaking and the, the red is just kind of isolated to the throat and then you have brownish streaking. The purple finch typically has blurred purple streaks or reddish streaks, not, not that defined dark streaking on the flanks. Um, another thing to note, the house finch has that kind of brown cheek patch um, with just a red cap. The purple finch has a purple cheek patch and also both male and female Purple finches have this sort of distinctive light supercilium, which is the, one of the feathers above the eye, the light supercilium above the eye. And then they also have that sort of like white patch at the back of the cheek. Um, so that facial pattern, if you look at pictures of male and female purple finches, um, if you get to know that facial pattern, it'll certainly help you to uh, identify both of them. Purple finches also have more coloration going on to the back and the wings of the birds, whereas house finches are more brown. All right, I think we're going to jump to questions now. Yeah, thank you so much, Jacob. That was that was great. Um, we do just wanna make sure we leave a few minutes for questions here. Um, so as a reminder, if you have 
questions for any of the panelists, you can enter them into the Q&A tool that you should see at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we'll start with a question here for anyone um, that wants to answer. Somebody asking, you know, how much do you need to know about bird, bird varieties to be helpful during the CBC? Yeah, so I guess I can comment on that, or Cassie, if you wanted to as well. Um, so species level identifications are the most useful for Christmas bird count purposes. Um, so species meaning like separating black capped chickadees from white breasted nuthatches. Um, well, the Christmas bird count makes it sound like you might just be going out and getting a tally of, of every bird that you're seeing. We're also tallying species and the number number of, of birds that, of individuals of each species that we are we are seeing along the way. Yeah, and I would just add that um, you don't have to know anything about birds and the Christmas bird count can be your gateway to learning about birds and um, usually your compiler will pair you up with someone who knows a lot and can teach you. Um, so, you know, bring your friends, bring your family. I highly encourage you to just get out there and start learning. Um, I would recommend bringing a, a field guide with you just to help you if you are unsure, um, but definitely don't hesitate to get involved if you don't think you know anything. I just joined my first Christmas bird count last year, and it's a lot of fun and a great community science project, so don't hesitate. Awesome. Thank you both. Um, another question here, what's the recommended time spent at one particular spot? Mm, I'm, I'll probably leave this to uh, Jacob or Corey, but um, I just want to note that, you know, it's kind of up to you. You can join the Christmas bird count for an hour, or you can go out um, before the sun comes up and go owling, or you can, um, you know, spend all day doing it, but just work with your compiler and arrange with them ahead of time what you're willing to do what um, you're able to do and interested and they'll kind of um, assign a section and then um, depending on how long it takes to walk or drive that area um, will determine how long you're out there. Yep. Yeah, I think that's a great point. It really is dependent on what sector in each circle you're paired up with, you know, how many, how many miles of roads you're going on you know, how much area you plan to cover in any given day, that kind of will impact how much time you spend at any one given location. Awesome, thank you. Um, and a question here from Lynn who asks, how do I participate in my local area? Hey Lynn, thanks for your question. Um, so you will just go to the Audubon website and you'll find the link for that map that will help you locate which circle is closest to you or closest to where you want to bird. And that's where you find the location. Um, we can include that link in the follow-up email, um, but that's how you find your circle. Awesome, thank you. Um, and a question here from Rebecca, advice for first time feeder watchers, should we take pictures too? Pictures are always helpful for sure, um, especially if you are unsure of the ID, um, it'll give your compiler a little bit more information. Um, but as far as data collected at your feeder, you'll just wanna know the species you're seeing, um, the largest number at any given time of each species, and then how many hours you spent watching at your feeder. And I'll add, if you do see something unusual, it's really helpful if you can get a picture. There's a special form that National Audubon makes you fill out for really unusual sightings. And pictures are always accepted where your eyewitness account can be a little dicier. Them. Thank you. Um, another question here, have the compilers all added their chosen dates yet, or is some of that information still forthcoming? Yeah, so the current Audubon CBC map of circles, um, some circles have added their dates. I think most CBC compilers have selected a date by this point, 
Um, on the Audubon Vermont webpage, we are currently put, going to be putting up a, a newspaper or a newsletter like snippet that will have all the updated um, dates and email addresses. So if that comes out, we can send that along to the attendees of this meeting as well uh, once that is completed. Okay, awesome. But if a, if a compiler, if the date hasn't been added to the website yet, it still, it will be added once that the compiler's chosen and uploaded it to the site. Yep, or, and sometimes it just takes a little while to get it into the system. So you can always reach out if you're interested, um, reach out most, we, we said the, do you remember the Christmas bird count window, um, Cassie? But if it's, if it's within that date, you can always just reach out to the compiler and they can let you know what the date is. Yeah, the, the date range again is um, the 14th of December through the 5th of January. Um, but yeah, their email should be listed even if the date isn't quite up there yet. Um, so definitely reach out and see if you can get more information. Awesome, thank you. So I think that's a great stopping point for us. Um, so like we said, we'll be sending out um, an email in the coming days with a whole bunch of resources um, from um, Audubon, more, more information um, and as well, um, like I mentioned, some BLT spots to bird. Um, and we'll also be sending around a survey. Um, we'd love your feedback on this webinar, what's been helpful, what hasn't been helpful, um, anything you'd like to share with us, um, we'd love to hear that as well. So thank you so much, everyone, for taking the time to join us this evening. Thank you to Jacob and Corey and Cassie um, for this great information. And have a wonderful evening, everyone, and happy birding. Bye, thank you.